Hi, uh, welcome you all to Data Life Playbook Leadership Podcast. And today in our show, we have David Rose. And so David Rose is an award-winning entrepreneur, author, and instructor at MIT Media Lab. His research focuses on making physical environment an interface to digital information. David is CEO of Ditto Labs, uh, an image recognition software platform which scars social media photos to find brands and products. His book, Enchanted Objects, uh, focuses on the future of Internet of Things and how these technologies will impact the way we live and work. Prior to Ditto, uh, David founded and was CEO of Vitality, a company that reinvented medication packaging, now distributed by CVS, Walgreens, and Express, uh, Express Scripts. He founded Ambient Devices, which pioneered glanceable technologies, embedded internet information, in everyday objects like lamps, mirrors, and umbrellas. David holds patents uh, for photo sharing, interactive TV, ambient information displays, medical devices. His work has been featured um, at the MoMA, covered in New York Times, Wired, and The Economist, and pa parodied um, on the Colbert Report. So David, thank you so much, and welcome to the show. Thanks, Vishal. Fun to be here today. Awesome. So yeah, so why don't we start with um, Ditto, like what, what it is and, and, and what do you do there? Sure. Uh, well, I'm the founder and CEO of a four-year-old uh, company uh, with most of the founders coming out of MIT. And we realized that there was a huge opportunity uh, in how people communicate, which is, you know, the, the world of social media has really gone from being something that's a text-based medium to being something that's almost purely photos. I mean, really, it's almost remarkable how quickly that shift has happened. Mm. And so people are today sh sharing 3.2 billion photos every single day. And that's through phones. And you know, there, there are going to be more and more photos as, as these cameras jump out of phones and into wearables and trash cans and you know, many, many other things around us, rings, jewelry, etc. But we realized a couple of years ago that there was this great uh, macro trend happening of photos being the way that people spoke, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, Advertising Age, when they first wrote about us, called this uh, a blind spot for mm -hmm. marketers and a potential gold mine. Because uh, if you're interested in seeing uh, in understanding how people are, quote, talking about your product or brand, which is something that nearly every company wants to know, they you could do that with text search if you were to text search Twitter or text search Facebook, but with photos, you really need image recognition. Hmm. So we built a company around developing algorithms and patenting, patenting those algorithms to be very efficient at finding the brands initially uh, now objects and scenes, uh, and um, even the even being able to judge photos on what are the best, most compelling photos, or most most romantic photos, or most exciting photos that are shared on social media. So that was really the the, the genesis of the company was okay. uh, using image recognition, doing it in the cloud, and then building a set of tools, some dashboards that would help marketers understand three things. One is, how is my product being used? Another one is, how often is it being seen on social media com compared to my competitors? And the third is really looking at who are the people exactly who are wearing Manchester United or driving a Jeep or posing in front of a pickup truck or eating chocolates or mm. drinking a Red Bull or whatever they, they want to know about. So understanding that that third component is really going to change advertising because you can now micro-target those populations. Interesting, interesting. So uh, thank you uh, so much for sharing that. So uh, actually, I've been a great fan of your, your work um, of bringing technology to the objects. I think that's what sort of I get. It was a fascinating idea. And, and we are now actually seeing that emerging every... Um, my, my door lock is now connected with the Wi-Fi and internet. There are a lot of things that, that, that we are seeing this, this integration happen. So I think I want to know like how how is that shift of uh, bringing technology to the to the everyday objects now to a image recognition company like what's the mindset shift that um, like why you are here where you are, where you are from 
from where you have been? Yeah, so early early on, I uh, back in the 90s, I worked on a project uh, when I was at the Media Lab called the Lego Mindstorms Project, and actually founded a company, and one of the projects was to help commercialize that work. And so that was, you know, a pro- actually, my, my son just went to camp last week to Lego Mindstorms camp at Harvard, which was, <laughs> wow. was really sort of, you know, full circle, like this, uh, you know, how many years ago was that? 20, 20 years ago. Uh, so... Uh, that was that was a project about putting sense and uh, uh, computation and sensors into Lego bricks so that people could build and build behaviors for anything that you could imagine. From like he built a little robot that had a long nose so that when the nose wasn't over a table, it would back up and go the other direction. So that was you know a way of nice. you know, building building something he could imagine and then building behavior on top of that. So that was you know, that was Internet of Things before we had that terminology to call it Internet of Things. That was the Internet of Legos. But now <laughs> you know, the, the, the trend that we have is to Im- embed sensors in all the things that we encounter around us because you know it it just it provides a more seamless a more uh, simple and a more convenient user experience versus a versus an app. So my last company invented medication packaging, a pill cap that could, that would know whether it was opened. And if it hadn't been opened, it would it would make a sound. It would it would pulse with light. It would send you a text message. It would call your home phone. You know, it would do all of these services, and then it would also keep track of how often you've taken the meds, and it would share that that data with loved ones or your transplant doctor. Um, and if you could do that, in, you know, in a Lego brick or in a pill cap, you know, the the the, the market or the field is so wide open for right. making you know, things from lighting to clocks to plants to thermostats to trash cans to coffee tables. You know, nearly everything can be and will be connected, um, and it you know disrupts business models. It converts objects into services. And in my book, uh, Enchanted Objects, I talk about six different um, uh, aspirations or psychological drives that connected objects tend to satisfy. And these are our wish for omniscience, to be all-knowing, telepathy, to communicate with other people, safekeeping, to live a long and healthy life, immortality, teleportation to move seamlessly and effortlessly around the world and personal expression and one of the things that I noticed about all these internet connected everything is they tend to use cameras more and more Mm. so like the Anoto pen is enchanted because it has a camera in its tip and it notices everything that you write down and it stores all that in the cloud or the um, magic paintbrush that we invented at the Media Lab, you know, that's something where you sample the world, you sample a bowl of M&Ms, or you sample uh, mm-hmm. color from your shirt, and then you can paint with that texture. Um, but both of those are examples of putting a little micro camera in the tip of a pen or a paintbrush. And I think we're going to start to see more and more uses of cameras taped onto lots and lots of things. Like we did a, a trash can at the Media Lab as a prototype, and it was called the Amazon Trash Can. It basically had a, ta- a camera taped to the inside of the lid, so it noticed what you threw out, and it could reorder nice. the stuff you're done with from Amazon. But what you need there is an internet-connected camera and computer vision. Um, so I realized that you know computer vision is really very much the friend of, <laughs> of Internet of Things, <laughs> And it's the way that you make sense of all of this unstructured data that people are taking pictures of or that trash cans are taking pictures of. Interesting. So uh, I think definitely a fascinating idea, right? So so now uh, when you're, so let's go back to the early days of Ditto, right? So you come up with this idea that, hey, sensor and photo sensors, that's the that's next, next evolution. And you want to be early in that, that sort of bandwagon as well. So like... How do you decide for uh, for a company of uh, of of this stature? Like, so what was the first thing that comes to your mind, and the following couple of thoughts when you put together a system that um, that deals with what Ditto deals with, like the image processing and all? Yeah, I think we knew that the terms of competition for f- image recognition were just a few things. One is we needed to be um, to have a very big catalog. 
meaning we needed mm. to be able to process social media, a lot of social media, and find a lot of things that brands would care about. So we very quickly went from finding 500 of the biggest brands in the world to a thousand to at the end of the first year I think we were at two thousand brands now we're at seven thousand brands so we look at all of the consumer package goods and quick service restaurants and sports logos um, and consumer and consumer electronics and you know we basically built a, a, a way we trained on all of those on all those patterns uh, so that we can now find those so when a new company comes to us like Unilever had you know we had a call mm. with them this morning and they said you know can, can you find Ben and Jerry's and we were like like we mm. already have <laughs> you know we have a right. years of data on Ben and Jerry's uh, nice. so so one is the breadth of the catalog another one is the ability to efficiently find that in literally hundreds of millions of photos a day that we're processing and to do that affordably so we did a lot of work and are still doing a lot of work on making the algorithms such that it doesn't cost us a fortune to run. Mm hundreds of Amazon servers continuously to process all the social media photos for brands and scenes and objects. That was sort of, a, you know, we knew, we knew we had to find a lot of things and do it efficiently. Um, and the other, the, I mean, the sort of where, we at, where we're at now is um, we know that we have to train new things and to train mm -hmm. those things um, with high precision and high recall. So. Right. Somebody, you know, we just did a work for a beauty product company last week, um, and they said, you know, we have 16 different hairstyles that we've identified, and we make shampoos and, you know, whatever, uh, gel and conditioners and whatever for 16 different hairstyles. So we need to go, we need to find out, with using computer vision, which hairstyle a certain person has. So we built classifiers quickly using training data that they provided for this is straight hair and this is wavy hair and this is curly hair and this is kinky hair um, so that we could uh, now we now have classifiers for you know, when we see a woman's face we can say this is the hairstyle that she has and this company now can you know, target those people with only kinky hairstyles. So the ability to, to build new, the ability to see new things for customers um, is sort of another big point of differentiation. Interesting. So um, I think that brings me to my next question. So, so when you when you figured out your first uh, first classifier or, or your first product that you want to go go ahead with, so how do you come up with that uh, category? And then what? How do you sort of add the new one? Like what are the some of the qualifiers to say, hey, this is we should pursue this and not really overkill ourselves with a lot of things. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, we have. Um, we have a framework that we use to understand uh, or to, to prioritize all of the different markets that we can go after. Is, so we've identified many uses of computer vision. Maybe you can put a link in the blog uh, to our vision catalog where we try to sure. articulate what is it that marketers want to see in photos. You know, they want to see like the demographics of people and whether it's a selfie or not and the age of the people that are using the product and the context. But there's also uh, con consumer packaged goods brands care a lot about packaging. They care about cups versus boxes versus cans versus uh, all the other things that are, you know, all that make up the the options for packaging. And they want to understand right. how are people eating their Chobani yogurt in the car or drinking their Red Bull at a hot beach or you know because all of those things drive decisions about packaging. Um, fashion and beauty brands care about. Uh, things like not just who's wearing what, but what the celebrities are wearing and what are the trends in that data. Um, hotel and hospitality brands care a lot about finding not just the photos of a hotel, but the best photos or the most persuasive photos that can help convert the most people into into using that hotel. So, you know, there, there are literally a dozen or more uh, verticals, industry verticals, that all need computer vision. So as we think about how to prioritize those, we look at four factors. We look at how quickly does that industry tend to adopt new things? You know, like marketing, marketing software companies tend to adopt very quickly. Companies right, like right. Um, retailers, uh, insurance companies, uh, security companies, real estate companies, 
telcos are probably the worst <laughs> for yeah, you know yeah. health healthcare companies. They all tend to adopt um, much more slowly. So mm-hmm. pace of adoption is number one. Number two is the the size of the market. Number three is the value that they perceive with computer vision. And the last one I think is maybe the most interesting for our current strategy, which is do they bring photos to the table? So oh, we believe that the opportunity in computer vision is to create this two-sided market where we're training custom classifiers that we wouldn't be able to train if we didn't have partners that had special that had special access to information. Like this beauty beauty company, like I wouldn't have known that there were 16 different hairstyles right. and have training data for all of that. Or for travel and hospitality companies like I don't know what represents a romantic photo or a luxurious photo or a modern photo or a quiet hotel or a boutique hotel, but they can come to the they can come to the party with this training data, which then helps our system um, grow and learn and um, become more discerning when it looks at a photo, and and the whole ecosystem can can uh, benefit from that work. So when we go to the next automotive company we can already have trained all the car types and all the car profiles and all the car silhouettes and all the car grills and all the hubcaps so that the next car company can benefit from that training data. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Yes, absolutely. So it, it makes sense. So now um, um, let's talk about uh, deep learning or sort of some um, analysis that, that you do. Uh, so whenever I think one of the positive outcome is that you, you discover things, you sort of you learn uh, that uh, what image is what but on on the flip side uh, it also has uh, a, a sort of a, uh, a worry of unanticipated finding i think uh, uh, rumsfeld put it the best that uh, like unknown unknowns and known unknowns right so how do you like is there any any interesting find that this algorithm has or or sort of this discovery have shown you and and is there like is there any example where sort of you uh, made a discovery which you were not anticipating and you end up adopting in, in the algorithm and how is that process um, what the, the process was to recruiting that particular logic saying yeah let's do that yeah i i mean i think there are a, well i should first say that that our algorithms run on photos that our customers provide to us so mm-hmm. We go out and read certain streams of public social media, and so we have an API called the Social Stream, where people can sign up and they can say, "Give me all the photos that correspond to boat brands, or bottled water brands, or beer brands," um, and we'll give them all those photos that correspond to the things that we've pre-read off of public photos. But then mm-hmm. the the API that most most of our customers use is the one that I was just describing where they bring their own photos to the table. So they may have access to Pinterest or to Weibo or to um, blogger networks or websites and they want to they want to send us the photos and have us read the photos and then provide that data back. And in those cases we see lots of really interesting correlations between uh, between the things that people have in photos, like the brands that co-occur in photos, and in some in some cases the the affinities of people as sort of a marketing cross tab. So we can we can mm-hmm. say what is the for those people that have consumer electronics brands in their photos, what is the most worn outdoor brand? Uh, and it turns out it's North Face. Or mm-hmm. <laughs> for those people that own a boat. Like what is the other brands that they prefer of cars, um, or uh, if people wear certain sunglasses, what uh, what be- what other beauty brands do they do they have? or where do they live, or uh, do they tend to be Hispanic or black? Um, so all of these sort of insights uh, that we're getting are, are sort of a marketing uh, goldmine for for big brands like P and G and Unilever, because uh, that those are exactly the questions that they have is like. What's trending in Hispanics that are millennial, you know, that are at a theme park today, <laughs> or that go, to, or that go wow. to Coachella today, or that are shopping for back to school? Um, so that sort of marketing cross tab, I think, is really powerful, powerful data that you only get right. if you're looking at these millions and millions of photos every day. I guess I, interesting. I just wanted to say, but like sort of about the future of deep learning. Um, right. I think one of the most interesting things that we're seeing is 
the ability to not only find the um, the explicit objects and scenes that are expressed in a photo, uh, like dogs and cars and boats and that type of thing, but also these subjective classifiers. So we're building, as one of my computer vision guys says, um, if two people can agree on it, you can build a classifier. So mm, we're building classifiers for the, the most persuasive or the most alluring or the most exciting or the most memorable. And this is really powerful because if, like all companies, you're like all marketing departments, you're trying to find user-generated, authentic content that helps right, right. you show how people are using coolers when they go fishing or shows how people are um, wearing outdoor research hats when they're mountain biking or, you know, like any, if you're looking for those, those, those types of examples, they're already there on Instagram. But now your job is like right. now you've got a million examples of, of people you know with with igloo coolers fishing, like how do you filter for the best ones and feature those on the igloo website, and we're doing exactly that by by all of these photos to say yep it's got an igloo cooler and this is mm -hmm. the subset of all of those photos that's the most that's the best photo that's closest to a pro photo but is still a user generated content. Interesting, interesting. So so basically what, I, what I'm hearing is, so if you come up with any any of these sort of random findings, you go back to the sponsor saying that we have this additional use case that we discovered. Are you up, like, do you want to know more about that use case or, or, or something like that? So is there any, any case where sort of uh, you actually stumble upon something that's not, so that's not relevant to this particular guy, but it's actually or it, it's actually opened up a different kind of research uh, opportunity for you. Uh, that's like total unexpected discovery that uh, that the, that uh, the um, the machine learning has in, it sort of imparted and now. How yeah, I think there are? there are a couple of examples of that. I think usually we're looking for the best photos as you know the, as a goal. We like try to find the the GoPro part of your video that's the most exciting. Um, but I think one of the use cases that we found that, uh, I mean, we just were working with a hotel brand and they said uh, they really care about customer service issues and they care about learning about them immediately. So <laughs> could we please find um, bugs in photos and stains, like spiders and stains and uh, you know things that look broken? in photos wow. <laughs> uh, sorry and we didn't realize it would be so useful to find the, the stuff that's broken not the stuff that's nice um, and we're seeing the same equivalency on uh, like every high-end fashion brand from Gucci to Prada to Yves Saint Laurent they're all looking for uh, knockoffs of their bags so <laughs> so it's it's actually a pretty it's a pretty hard thing to do with computer vision to say oh well it's not quite right but um but you can spot bag types and you can see where they're being posted from and what people are saying about them and sometimes that represents uh sort of a brand risk use case mm. and the other one was for uh, uh one of the big telcos they sell phones um the one i'm thinking of is a phone sorry a phone seller and they really liked the use case of finding shattered phones, shattered screens, mm. because as soon as somebody drops their like Samsung or their LG or their Apple phone, then that represents an opportunity to the, for the brand to sweep in and say, "Hey, don't <laughs> don't buy another iPhone. Give the give the you know the LG phone a try." Um, so sometimes it's the it's the the way in which things are broken that's more interesting than the best photos. Another another quick story about that is. Uh, there's a large consumer electronics uh, kitchen appliance maker that is putting uh, cameras inside the oven, and they want to find what is what's the what's the you know are, are people making kale or cookies, and uh, is the is the item done because because no everybody wants perfectly baked cookies and, and so, so, it's, so sometimes that's another case of like finding the you know, making, making sure you have the good looking thing and not the burned one, you know, not the shattered one, not the, not the spiders in the hotel room, not the, um, so I think there's, there's this big use case of sort of finding, uh, finding the ugly and the broken in the world, um, 
and doing that with computer vision. Oh, I just have I have one more story about I was talking to uh, there was a company called MetaMind that was acquired by Salesforce a couple of weeks ago, and I was talking to the founder, uh, and he said one of their um, uh, customer stories was about working with insurance companies uh, who get lots of pictures of smashed up houses and cars, and they were building classifiers to to be able to estimate the the, the damage amount from the photo. Isn't that cool? Wow. So you could say, like, is the car totaled or not totaled? Yeah. Based on, based on looking at, based on having a deep learning network, looking at the photo and and estimating the sort of value of the damage. Wow. So so like um, so do you see do you see an opportunity where um, something like say, like your classifier helps a real time say ad delivery platform in a way? So you say hey throw a coupon or something so or, uh, like do you already have something in play or or, mm-hmm. or you are saying um, that's a, as one of the future thing sort of a derivative of the allure right. classifier that we have which is okay. um, and it's sort of a it's a little bit of a special personalization case because you can say this is a better photo than this but you can also say this is a more persuasive photo in the context of a social media ad hmm. and and for a particular person or customer and customer set who's looking at it um, so you can you can really do micro targeting with this type mm. of technology where you can say, you know, I mean, if if you're trying to advertise to me and my wife differently for an upcoming vacation, you'd show like a Club Med shot of kiteboarding or or uh, water skiing to me, and then you'd show a different photo to my wife, probably like mm. the kids club or the you know the places that the, the the serene beach where you can sit down and read. So you'd have very different photos for different audiences. Um, and sometimes you have to know about the audience, but sometimes you can get that from just the search term. Mm. So for hotels and hospitality, like you know that somebody's coming in typing for typing like um, kid friendly uh, resort in Aruba. Right. Like you're going to show different photos if they say kid friendly resort versus just Aruba resort. But today, there's no personalization that's happening when you just type in kid-friendly result. I mean, how do you? How would you know which photo to put in front of the kid-friendly research results unless some person, you know, decided on all of those words? So, so we're building that sort of personalization based on those concepts. Wow, wow! I think that's fascinating. I have fascinating stories, by the way. So, so now let's let's talk about some of the business challenges, right? Uh, for something like Ditto. So, and, and Imagenetics company. Uh, pretty early in its in its times, uh, doing some radical stuff. So, what are some of the challenges that you are facing, and um, that someone can relate to? Yeah, I, you know, every day there's this sort of existential crisis about um, about focus because we have inbound requests from people that you just you don't know as the entrepreneur whether. Like, will building this for this customer is that really the fo- should that really be is that really the business right. or right. is that a big, is that a distraction? And, you know, it's your, it's your job as the CEO to help the sales team, you know, focus their efforts, like ignore 90% of what they're, of what they're hearing. That's especially that's inbound, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, filter for deals that are above a certain threshold in terms of the, the deal value or could grow to a certain deal value. Um, and that's just you're have to you're having to make these hard calls of like what's on strategy, what's off strategy, mm. what's a distraction mm. versus what's core to the business, and especially in computer vision, like I just gave you like fifty stories, right. twenty stories right. of yeah. of you know all the ways that it could be applied, and you know, it, so I mean one of the one of the op- opportunities I think uh, is. You really you want to be a fast follower to the extent that you can. Like mm. any when I talk to any entrepreneur and they say like we're the only company doing X and I'm like yeah. well that's a, that's <laughs> by definition it's a mistake then because why wouldn't somebody else be doing that? Um, so it really helps to have competition. Mm. I mean it really helps to because you're sharing your market spend with all of your competitors. Right. You know like right. I'm I'm delighted that. Google Photos came out, mm. and it's free, mm. and everybody's mm. uploading their photos to Google Photos. Um, Flickr now has a deep learning component, so you can upload your photos to Flickr, and it will organize them by 
trucks and cats and all the other things that we're doing. Right. Um, you know, I see that as helping to educate the market. And there, you know, and and, and there are other Apple's about to come out with a, a service too because they mm. did an acquisition mm. in the space. Right. So I'm so happy to have you know. There's a company in New York called Clarify. Um, uh, I can tell you, I, th- I think we're better than them at a bunch of things, mm. but mostly I'm just happy to have them in the market because mm. all of the blogging and all of the speaking and all of that stuff that they're doing is just helping to put computer vision on the list yeah, of right. what brands that's have to have. I mean, we just got a um, uh, RFP from Coke uh, just two, I guess, two weeks ago, and it basically said, must have computer vision to mm. find coke in social media and that's fa- that's like, like gold yeah, for us right. because then now we can now we can go to all the companies mm. who would who haven't been who are consuming our data like oracle and brand watch and synthesio and clarify and not clarify uh clarebridge mm. um mm. all of these companies that are already using our data and we can say hey look coke needs you and us right. together right. so that's good right. because we have this partnership together already and you're already consuming our data and we're already integrated into your tool which is our position in the value chain right but then we can right. also go to anybody who we might want <laughs> to do the deal with right. and say look your text analytics tool is not sufficient but don't you don't have to believe me it's coke that wants that wants it and that's a million dollar contract so right. Um, right. you know you better you better step up and integrate the data today, otherwise you're not you're going to start losing a lot more than this contract. Right. So right. Interesting. interesting. So I mean, so I think we struggle um, as entrepreneurs to sort of want to be first, to want to be patented, mm. to want to be special. But ultimately, it's going to be so much easier to be uh, further along in the adoption curve. Right. Like I, <laughs> I often I often challenge my uh, my coworkers. They're like, oh, well, we have to be the only ones doing this. I'm like. We're we're out to lunch right now at a burrito store. Is that like the only burrito store out there? Like, thank goodness we're all trained to like burritos. Right. And, and right. Uh, so, I think I mean many of these markets is not winner like mm. one winner take all. Right. It's um it's gonna, right. you know we're gonna be differentiated based on the quality uh, the quality our customer service our focus our branding our marketing like. All of those things matter. Interesting. No, I think de- definitely, and, and and thank you so much for being being candid about that and sharing those concerns. So now uh, let's talk about some of the technical challenges uh, that you as a platform face. So you briefly mentioned about that uh, you need to. There's always a tendency to be over sort of blown by by the data and sort of. So what are some of the some of the technical challenges um, that a company like Analyt- like Ditto, uh, uh, image analytics company faces, and then how do you sort of end up addressing those? Um, I mean, for us, I think one of the biggest challenges is um, just having a really fast database architecture because uh, (laughs) we're a needle in the haystack uh, type of use case where someone says, I'm looking for all pictures posted by Hispanics in front of a truck in Tennessee, you know, uh, where the person is someone of influence and it's after four in the afternoon and uh, you know they also own a dog or something you know I mean it's like mm. these mm. it's this huge faceted search question um, that can start everywhere you know it could start anywhere it could say um, I'm looking I'm looking for this time of day I'm looking for this geo I'm looking for this object I'm looking for this context I'm looking for this brand I'm looking for this demographic you could start with any of those questions and then you want to keep like narrow 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 it's almost like when you're shopping for a a, a car and you say I'm looking for like Audi or BMW or Nissan and should have less than this many miles and cost mm. less, you know, between this range and it has to be this close to my house and it has to be this color and it has to be, you know, all like all of these has to have a car rack. So we have that same problem with our data, except mm. instead of having a million cars, you know, we have a database that has billions of records and being able to quickly you know, provide sub-second answers to those questions um, is a huge tech- technical challenge. So that that maybe is one of the one of the largest is just the volume of data and being able to answer any question that any marketer may have going back for all time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> On, you know, like how did my like we just worked with a movie studio a couple of months ago that which was how did uh, how did this movie perform relative to 
the other seven movies that we launched in the last year. Mm. So if you t- if you line up all the time all the all the time lines, like did we get this much exposure three weeks before launch in mm. the other movies? And so there was just a lot of like moving timelines around and being able to answer that question and then say because they wanted to know which creative is resonating in which markets so that they should pour, so they should amplify this advertising campaign in you know Atlanta so that they can really amp up the launch of the movie and so they were trying to understand what was working in different markets before the movie launched right wow okay wow that's some fascinating use cases by the way so uh, so now uh, let's talk about uh, one of the issues that, that I'm sure you must be hitting a, a lot of times is it's around privacy so we we, we, we talked about kid picture we talked about um, uh, what looking at someone's garbage and figuring out what if something is finished we're looking at we're talking about uh, looking at in the oven and seeing if the cookies are baked or whatever so what are some of the concerns that you as a company face and what are some of the concerns that you think that uh, as an industry so like we, we all need to address um, like uh, w- like uh, how much of the scanning uh, is okay and, and all that so w- what's your perspective on those I think my answer for that is around Internet of Things is what really matters is, um, uh, you know, how long data is retained and, you know, who has access to it mm. in that time period. Um, and my advice to startups in Internet of Things space is always like, do privacy by design. Like, mm. why does your thermometer, why, why can't your thermometer learn about your preferences, store the preference that you sleep late on Saturday, but never retain that you, you know, that you weren't at home on September 4th, you know, so there's a way to sort of anonymize the specifics and still learn from the general trends. And we're seeing this, um, certainly with Facebook, they have a, mm. a, a system called Pylon, which gives you um, access to sort of general trends without understanding specific data. Interesting. So, Interesting. And, we, and we have customers that do that too. They want to know, you know, for people that eat uh, Haagen-Dazs, hmm. you know, what time of day do they tend to do that? And, and, uh, and what, are the, um, uh, what are other brands that they tend to use? So we can, we can give them all day, we can give them data about things that these people tend to do or tend not to do, and that's really what they care about. I mean, in the case of haagen they don't really, they're not going to go after the set of 100,000 people that we, for which we have social handles hmm. and, try to, and try to market them ice cream. I mean, not yet. But I do think that the, the social media industry especially is going to go to one-to-one. Like, I don't know. A lot of people would 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 argue, would disagree with me, but I but I have to believe that, you know, Michael Coors will give you an offer for a bag if you own a Coach bag, like they that will just be sent to you as a coupon saying, oh, nice Coach bag. Have you considered a Michael Coors bag? Here's twenty percent off for a Michael Coors bag since you own a Coach bag. Um, like that's gonna happen, and it's um, and. I think one of and one of the ways that this data is being put to use, which I think is very sophisticated on the part of marketers, is to understand that people adopt things in networks. Right. So right. nobody, nobody. <laughs> I've one of our advisors is this guy Nicholas Christakis who wrote the book Connected, mm. and he said he said recently at a conference, he said, you know, asking one person why they did one thing is sort of like asking a. a, a a buffalo inside of a herd of charging buffalo like why they're heading in that direction like it's just sort of a ridiculous question like what would the buffalo say he wouldn't say why am i why am i heading in this direction like we we are heading in this direction we're you know we are doing this together um so it's not it's sort of ridiculous to ask one person you know if they'd be interested in owning a harley davidson right instead like look for those little warrens little pockets of of harley ownership and go after the guy who doesn't have one yet right but all of his but all of his friends do or five of his friends have recently purchased one or something like and that's the sort of sophisticated way that marketing i think will be done given photos and given social networks is we're going to start to target 
um, or brands will start to target the sort of little micro communities because right. the, the network is all graphed, is, is all uh, plumbed. And so you might as well use that in those insights. Interesting. I think so. Recently, I was talking to a bank and it, it's a global bank. And, and I think they have the similar challenge within the bank. So they say we although we have the same data, we have same employees, we have same sort of engagements. But Europe has a totally different way to look at data than than U.S., so even within within our bank, it's a nightmare to to figure out privacy from our from our own people working on on, on our own agenda. So like mm. now considering those legal norms, right? So even for Facebook, although uh, uh, Facebook opens an API to you or or like to to all the image analytics vendors, and they they sort of they scan and process this data. So. Would you leave it, uh, leave the onus to Facebook to sort of be that that end? Because I think one of the things that he was explaining me was, I would rather have the decision to be on 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 the node and not on the on the processing end because we like because we can't carry all these overages at our at our end. So it, it's better be when it comes to us, it better be filtered. Otherwise, like the entire system will be lo- with, filled with a lot of overheads. So is that is mm. that like your thinking as well? Or like what's, what's your perspective on sort of those legal yeah, issues? I think you know, we've, really, we've really obeyed the, the privacy um, uh, rights that the social networks have implemented. Mm. And you know, that's really sort of been the way that we've taken guidance. You know, we have, we have two sort of use cases that, that seem uh, like they're stepping right up to the line. One is a security use case. And so, you know, we're finding um, tattoos, ISIS logos, and, um, you know, other types of like flags that uh, that have, um, that are potentially, you know, sort of risky or like AK-47s or right. guns and smoke. Um, and the other, and the other one is, uh, there's a very large multinational that is doing background checks for new employers. Um, so if you're going to be hired by the DMV in Brazil or the equivalent of the DMV in Brazil, right. they'll look at all your social media f- stream and see if you're, uh, you know, if, if you have knives, if you have guns, if you have, you know, sort of how you spend your time, at least on social media. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I think that's probably, it's probably good to do a certain amount of background checks. Um, I think maybe many people probably don't realize that computer vision is being applied um, I think in that case it's private data because their employers right. are requesting the data, right. um, but I don't know. Okay, interesting. So uh, now let's talk about about uh, a bit on the culture side. So since um, this industry is rapidly growing, image analytics, a lot of things are coming up, and when sort of when you are actually getting the industry uh, getting on, on a ripe uh, angle, so you see a lot of businesses on the fence. Like we, as a human, sort of we have a tendency to be resistance to change. And then sort of we talk about using this ra- this radical ideas and radio sort of radical um, idea of image processing and helping your brand. Although the, the, the idea is fascinating, so how would um, how would you convince someone who's on the fence of, of using something like Ditto uh, to help their uh, analysis? Like what would be, be your pitch to those guys? Well, I think the the sort of fear of missing out is maybe mm. the most the most persuasive. I mean we for all of the photos that we find that we label on social media only 15 percent could have been found with any sort of text search so they're missing like 85 percent of 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 what we're finding uh without computer vision and that's pretty persuasive for mm-hmm. mo- most brands they say sounds like a you know it sounds like a lot of data and we, <laughs> we, we do we do we do and it is a lot of data so um I mean, we do. We, I was just talking to this um, uh, to this Ben and Jerry's uh, brand manager this morning, and I just we did a quick calculation of, of all of the photos that we find. How many people actually follow the brand or like the brand on Facebook? Mm. And it's like less than two percent. So if you're really trying to find your audience, they're not following you. They're not liking you. Like you need to look for other signal. So that's pretty that's pretty persuasive in terms of getting them to. Uh, to tune into the awesome. Um, so, from your perspective, there's there's a lot of uh, uh, IoT world is expanding. Uh, it's it it's it's having a lot of interesting play. Um, and what are some of the opportunities that you see uh, in image analytics as well as uh, in the in in the enchanted object side of things? 
and like what are some of the some of the hacks and some of the opportunities that you see that someone could pursue yeah i i see you know as the industry matures i think there will be more and more specialization of which part of the stack you want to play on so i mean there will be big there will be iot platforms there will be um sort of chip chip chipset makers there will be cloud providers like samsung is getting into arctic um there, there will be people that just orchestrate interactions between other IoT ecosystems. Um, and so I think more and more as the industry matures, there's a place for computer vision as a service, mm. meaning a company that doesn't need to make the cameras or the products, or the, but, but, needs, but needs to service those other companies that are making um, home security s- systems or wearables that have cameras embedded or... Uh, golf clubs that have cameras embedded or all the things that will have cameras embedded. Um, I, you know, I have a call in about an hour with a company that does digital jukeboxes wow. that are that yeah. are 70,000 of them in the country and they're in bars. Wow. wow. So, like, who knew that, yeah. like, all these bars have, ca- all, these, all these jukeboxes have cameras and now they're thinking about, you know, it was just for taking a selfie and getting, like, a photo booth use case, but now they want to figure out, like, who are the people that are in the bar and what drinks are they holding? And maybe maybe if you like if you bring your bud up to the jukebox, you get a free song and it's brought to you by Budweiser. And, you know, maybe it's a band that Budweiser is promoting. And, you know, so there's just there's so many there's so many use cases for computer vision. And, you know, I think Ditto is really dedicated to being the company that has an API that's mm-hmm. really easy to use, that you can toss thousands of photos at for free every month just to try to get your system uh, proof of concept done. And and then inevitably those relationships grow and grow and grow in terms of the content that people want to process. And you know those look like million dollar deals you know, five years later or four years later when the companies mature and want to process you know, hundreds of millions of photos a month. Interesting. Interesting. So that's sort of how I see, you know, and I guess for your, for, for the sort of smart pe- people that listen to this podcast, um, I'd really recommend a book by Kevin Kelly, which is uh, What Technology Wants. He, re- he also recently came out with another book called The Inevitable. Uh, but I think What Technology Wants offers this, a very good metaphor for how to think about uh, the, maturiza- the maturation um, of, uh, of a segment. So when you, when you think about like, what happens to any mature category, you, it looks like a coral reef, is what Kelly says, you know, where you have more specialization, more um, uh, diversity, and more, com- more animals sort of trying to carve out a niche mm. within the coral reef. And so you don't have like one fish to rule them all, right. but you, instead you have this huge diversity and, and we're, you know, think about that for any old mature technology like um, mugs, you know, mm. or stemware. Uh, you don't have one glass that you drink your brandy, your uh, liqueur, your wine, your white wine, your red wine. Like all of those have different vessels that are sort of optimized for drinking different things at different times of day. Or mm. shoes, or silverware, or clothing. Like you have this huge diversity of expression and of functionality. And I think that's that's what technology looks like when it comes to not only apps leaping off the phone into nearly everything around us, but also the role that companies can play to occupy sort of a place on the value chain mm. within that mature technology. I think that's a, that's a beautiful thought, and I think that um, is, is is a is a great thought to wrap it up uh, around. So, thank you so much, uh, um, Dave. I, I, again, it's always uh, amazing to chat with you. You have been super candid in sort of discussing your journey and sharing sort of a couple of those insights. And I think I do truly appreciate uh, you sharing sort of those thoughts and, 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 ex- and experience with, with our community. And love to have you again back on the on the platform sometime to uh, discuss your journey uh, in Ditto and wish you all the luck and uh, love to see you uh, in, in, in the field. Well, thank you so much, Vishal. This has been, it's delightful to spend time with you. And uh, I'm, I applaud the, Uh, your effort to get ideas and conversations like this out into the world. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. 
I thought I was sick of home, but actually I was homesick. Never really knew that I would have to grow up so quick. I'm so uncomfortable, don't know anybody here. Just a couple dudes that I met once, that's it. And I go into the booth feeling nervous. Got butterflies in my stomach like I'm so worthless. Is the mic gone? I don't know how to work this. Inside I'm breaking down, I hope I'm not up on the circuit.